A warm welcome to the EHFG 2023, and thank you so much for joining us here in Gastein and also to our online audience. We're now kicking off this EHFG with an exciting topic, and I would like to welcome you also on behalf of the European Health Union Initiative, which was actually launched here in Gastein in 2020. And what the initiative is calling for is more EU in health and more health in the EU. And it was uh, founded by the former commissioner, Andrea Kaitis, with many top experts supporting him. And uh, what they're also calling for is solidarity and security for all Europeans and environmental sustainability. So basically, for a very strong European health union. Uh, this initiative has been supported by the Bosch Foundation, uh, which is now the uh, Bosch Health Campus, and uh, a manifesto was published in 2020. And one of the main asks of the manifesto was a strengthening of the health workforce. Uh, and promoting the, the uh, adaption of the training of the health workforce and also safeguarding the rights of health workers. And with the crisis that we're facing at the moment, and you know that our main topic is on, on health systems in crisis this year, we thought with that and with AI being one of the burning topics at the moment, very controversially discussed, of course, uh, this would be a great topic for us to put on the agenda and to kickstart the age of G with it. And it's now my pleasure to welcome Stefan Budicic, who uh, works for the Ministry for Health in Malta and has also made quite a name for himself in the digital health scene, but foremostly, he's a former younger Steiner. <laughs> so we're always very happy to see our younger Steiners rise. So uh, happy to see you back in Gastein and over to you, Stefan. Thank you. Big clap to Dorley, of course. Come on, guys. One of the masterminds. So. Health workforce in the age of AI. What are we up to, guys? And um, today we have like f five actually wonderful, one, two, three, four, six wonderful people because we have someone online. So keep in mind that this room is actually bigger than it is. <laughs> you know, there are extra tables, virtual ones, right over there, over there, right here, here, you know, because. It is, is bigger than we can think. And that's what's the beauty of the European Health Forum Gastein, that it's hybrid. And I just wanted to tell you as well that apart from that, you can make sure that you're active on social media with the hashtag hash EHFG2023, because I would love to hear your side of the story. How do you perceive all that is happening here? Does it affect you in your daily life? I want to really hear your thoughts. And social media is an opportunity for you guys to do that. Also, I'd like to make you aware of the fact that the session is being organized as well by the European Health Union. And one message that I would like you to bring forward is that doing things together is better. And with that in mind, I would like to see if we can invite Esti Shelley, who is the director of Digital Health Online, and also I would like to invite Ricardo Baptista Leite. Leite sorry, he said that he's. He said like to remember it, to say late, and I said, hmm, but you don't. You're not really late, Ricardo. So you're exactly on time. Just want to invite them on stage. Just want to see here, and can we just confirm that Esti is online, that uh, that you can see her possibly? That would be really great. I'm here. Good hey, ST. Looking great, Hi, ST. Looking great, you? looking great. Thank you. So, when we look about, when we think about AI, one of the first things that come to mind is regulation. We've all heard about the AI Act. It is something that maybe some of us understand, some of us don't. And we have two lovely people, ST and Ricardo, who will help us navigate this a bit. And I just wanted to kick off with a question to ST. So, ST. Could you kind of give us an insight into how AI has had an impact on health policy making in the recent years? Have you started seeing a shift like, and could you point out maybe some trends for us 
and the use of AI in policy making. Have you seen something? It would be really lovely to have your insight there. Esti? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, you can hear me, right? Fantastic. Uh, yes. And I'm sorry that. I'm sorry that I'm not able to be there with you physically and uh, saying best regards from Tel Aviv right now. Next, next year, um, SD, okay? Next year. Next year we'll next make year. It, definitely, for sure. So um, I think when we are talking about health AI, AI, AI uh, and specifically on policy making, um, I think one of the examples that we can look at is, of course, the COVID and the development of the vaccine for COVID, which actually made a lot of uh, change in the last years, and that's one of the major uh, achievements, I think, that we realized and understood that uh, the use of data and digital technologies can really bring to a solution for a world crisis. Um, but that's that's more like a high level uh, example. And one of the examples that we see here in Israel in recent years is a lot of being done in medical imaging. Uh, in medical imaging, we see uh, some clinical examples of using AI for, for prioritizing and support, I, I hear myself echo, uh, and prioritizing um, which which scans and which tests are? Uh, okay. Do you hear me? Sorry yeah, for. Yeah, we, we can hear you really well, Esti. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. I just suddenly hear myself in echo, so I wasn't sure what's happening. Um, some of the challenges of technology and being a uh, hybrid. Um, so one of the I think one of the interesting examples that we saw uh, in the most advanced in clinical uh, application here in Israel is the one that are, is using medical imaging, for example. Okay. Now, we do see some products that are already uh, approved in, uh, in the regulatory side uh, for prioritizing or identifying uh, diagnostic um, um, CT images and uh, mammography tests, and uh, etc. And I think those examples are interesting to hear or to learn about because I think what's more important than the algorithm or the AI engine that is approved in the regulatory pathway is what's happening in the health organization with this kind of, uh, with this kind of uh, platform. So one thing is to have the AI algorithm that is being approved, but the other, way, the other thing to, to keep in mind is what's happening in the hospital where they are using this kind of product. What, how they are changing the way that they are working, what they are doing with all those results of accidental findings that weren't exist beforehand. Yeah. When we are talking about um, the workforce in the healthcare system, that brings us a whole new set of limitations and challenges that we need to look at. Hester, I'm going to stop you there yeah. for a second, uh, because I'd sure. love to hear a bit Ricardo's thoughts here. So. Ricardo, when it's like we still haven't managed to make this link between AI and health governance. Do you have a solution for, the, for us there? Maybe some frameworks or some decision making tools that can help us get there, like help us do this puzzle? Sound. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Now it's working. Well, thank you, first of all, for the invitation. It's, uh, it's great to be here, and thank you for the question, and uh, I also greet Esti. And um, to say that one of the things that has uh, broken my heart many years from uh, f until today is the fact that when I started coming to Gastein, I was already too old to be a young Gasteiner. Oh. And so I, I really envy, I really envy Stefan, and I, I, I tell all of the young people in the audience really to embrace the opportunity. It's a fantastic network yeah. that, I, that I, I try to support as much as I can, and we should all, because you guys are the future of, uh, of healthcare in, uh, in our region. You're asking me a very difficult question, uh, mm. of course. Okay. And um, I, maybe we can start with the positive and throughout the conversation we'll be hitting some walls and challenges yeah. and okay. how, to, how, to, how to go through that. There is something that is very real in the real world, not in the digital world, that we need to address when discussing artificial intelligence and digital technologies, which is the fact that in most of the health systems in high-income countries, which is all of the European region, we ha don't really have health systems. We have disease systems. Mm. We have extremely broken systems okay. that need to be fixed. 
We have systems that focus on rewarding managers for making people sicker. We have systems that actually focus on production and do not focus on lowering the burden of disease. There are no real incentives to focus on community-based quality measures. Okay. There's no focus on well-being. There's no real concern around health workforce motivation, mm. mental health, which has become such a big issue throughout the, um, the pandemic. And even in terms of the transformation that health systems need to suffer, we're really not seeing great innovations at a large scale of transforming our institutional-based health systems towards a more hybrid model. What I mean by this is, you know, I have many years in policy making. Yes. It's so nice to open a new hospital, a big shining building with the pictures yeah. and on the front page of the newspaper. But actually, stop building hospitals, right? Oh, yeah. uh, we rebuild the ones that are crap and make sure that we transform the health system towards people lead, needing less hospitals, being able to stay at home when they need care. And that's where AI steps in. Yeah. Finally, we have come to the point, we've been discussing this for decades now. The thing is we didn't have the computational capacity to have technology to help us leverage this intelligence revolution for healthcare. We're there now. And so the issue is how do you embrace that? I would say from a governments and frameworks perspective, and you were asking about what kind of tools the policymakers need, the first fundamental issue is to address this correctly and not to hinder innovation, but at the same time making cer certain that citizens and institutions are safe, we need to make sure that there's a, a, a in-depth understanding of the technology that we are discussing. I run a network called Unite, Parliamentarians Network for Global Health, which is present in more than 100 countries. And we deal with policymakers across the board. I can tell you, most of them have no idea what AI really is. This is a challenge. And when you talk with the technical teams in parliaments, congresses, and senates, most of them don't have this level of specialization. Creating that awareness and knowledge base is critical. Being able to make sure that they understand the complexities of th what is an AI development life cycle, what are data sets, what is training models, mm. what is an algorithm, and understanding how to address all of these components when making decisions, the importance of data moving forward. AI poses the greatest risk in terms of widening the digital divide within countries and between countries. Okay. And that can lead to tremendous inequalities that we need to address. Lovely, Ricardo. So, Esti, some thoughts about that, whatever you could hear. I know it might be oh, a bit challenging, sure. but <laughs> quite a lot no, of no, essence I, there. I, I heard, I heard, uh, I heard uh, very clear um, everything that he said. Uh, I would start from the last point that he mentioned about how we are communicating the risks and all the challenges of uh, AI. And I would like to put another, um, another challenge and to say that we need to think about how we are balancing the risk with the benefits. Hmm. It's very scary to think about new technology that I guess each one in the room tried and used the Midjourney or ChatGPT oh. and was amazed by the, the, the solution and the answers that the, he or she gets. That's wonderful and, and sometimes it's really, really scary how we can regulate, how we can manage it. That's scary, but let's also put, and this is one of the things that we are always trying to put here in Israel, is also looking on the benefits. What What is the cost of not utilizing or not using this new technology? Hmm. Who are all those people that we won't treat because we are not embracing new technologies? Or what what is the loss of not using the, the new technology advance, advancement? And we need to make sure that Although new technologies might be uh, very scary and risky, yes, but there is a risk also not treating people. Yeah, so. And that's also something we need to remember. Um, and another thing that I would like to reflect, if I may add another yes, sentence. Um, one of the, I think, the interesting advantage that we have here in Israel is the fact that we have HMOs. HMOs are um, the insurers and the providers of, uh, of let's say, primary, mostly primary care in Israel. And the financial incentive that we have here and the, how the health economics works in Israel is that they are benefiting uh, or 
they are not for profit, so it's not that they have higher profit, but their benefit is when they are keeping their patients healthier. Uh, and we are making sure, and there is a lot of work in the economic incentives to make sure that this is how it works. And for example, one of the first implementations of AI here in Israel is by one of the HMOs that actually have a machine learning model that runs every night on all the patients that have diabetes in the HMO and looking on how they are treated, with what kind of medications they are taking, what are the last blood results and other, um, other uh, indicators they have in their clinical file, and to see whether there is a call for action that maybe their GP needs to act or to change or to modify or maybe some kind of red flags. Um, and that's actually not waiting for this person to feel worse and come to the GP and saying, I don't know, I don't feel so well. It's actually being more proactive and really embrace how you can use data and, uh, and machine learning in this, in this case uh, to provide a better care. So I think we do, I, I totally agree with the fact that we should move from disease-based uh, healthcare system to more preventive care, um, but we also need to make sure that the financial incentives are in the right place. Thanks, yes, that is uh, that's fair to the point, and I think that we're on to something. You, you can start seeing that there is a thread going along here, okay? and. I'd like to continue that thread, and I would like to invite three lovely panel speakers, all that I had like an opportunity to, to speak to this morning. One of them explored a bit the nature this morning, Regina. So please, Regina Rolle Vinsberger, who is a professor at the Medical University of Graz. You can easily grab a train from here and go there. So I'd love to invite Regina. Go for it. I also like to invite Terje, and Terje, very interesting, Terje Pezzo. She told me that she's an expert in, in joining the EU Commission and also leaving the EU Commission. Like, I, I, loved, I loved how she explained that. And now we also have Dr. Anita Pupper. And this is very interesting, Anita because she told me that she speaks 11 languages. I, I'm, I'm wondering if she will go through all of them throughout the panel, but what really, really struck me personally when we had like the briefing call about Anita is that she has worked in eight different countries as a medical doctor. Think about it, it's already difficult working in one country, now imagine eight. So I'd love to thank them and let's do a big clap to Esti and Ricardo. So big clap, guys, come on, you can do it. Awesome. Really, really thank you for that, for that insight, Ricardo. But now we'd like to move on to our lovely panelists here. And uh, first, Terje. So you are based in Estonia. You know, Estonia are amazing communicators when it comes to digital health. I'd like to applaud you for that. Well done. How have you seen AI in the Estonian healthcare system? Have you seen some practical applications, something pragmatic, something we can relate to? Yeah, Go ahead, Terry. Okay. Oh, my. Oh, I have a strong voice. <laughs> <laughs> wow, lovely. It's on. It's on. Go for it's it. on. <clears throat> I have such a strong voice, I didn't even notice that I don't have a microphone. <laughs> So, first of all, thank you so much for uh, inviting me and uh, giving me this opportunity to contribute to this discussion. Indeed, I am from Estonia. Estonia. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Uh, I have to say that um, I think there are much more opportunities that uh, digitization and AI uh, could offer than we actually use. But in fact, we do use some uh, of the tools. Uh, I think that the first uh, one that comes to my mind is the decision support system that is linked to our uh, digital prescription system, okay. which is the nationwide and uh, very popular. Uh, I think that today we can say that 99.99% .99 of all prescriptions are uh, digital 
hospital. Okay. And uh, it's one system for all uh, doctors and all uh, pharmacists. So I believe that uh, using AI as the decision support system there is um, uh, educating the system itself uh, at the same time. Oh. Uh, we also uh, use, uh, I know that our uh, clinicians, doctors and nurses are using the online websites for looking for information about the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the any kind of clinical questions that they may have. I think that the most simple AI that we are all using is the looking at the lab results where you have uh, uh, defined the limits lower and upper limit. We don't even think that it is somebody who is doing it like technically as AI. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, one of the most newest uh, tools that we used uh, recently, we are just concluding the results of that uh, pilot project, was to help our oncology patients. And uh, I am in particular uh, happy about that because that was aiming to support the patients in their journey, where uh, using the Kaiku platform, uh, patients uh, having access to the online uh, uh, tool, which uh, gives them an opportunity to uh, describe their uh, symptoms and complaints, as well as ask questions. And that is a very simple AI that uh, may give an answer. Not necessarily gives, but may give an answer. So we are just <coughs> concluding it uh, right now. It was the randomized study. So uh, happy to publish and help everybody else who is looking for the same tools to be used. I'm excited to hear about this randomized trial. Hmm, that takes balls, not double blind, to... but randomized. Randomized, lovely. You know, so we already started to um, to talk about this, but just a quick side. Just remember to go on slido.com, do hash wave. Hmm, I wonder where I have seen a wave. Oh, maybe here, and. Uh, Make sure that you go on slido.com, guys, right, Hashwave. And if you want to really engage in the <coughs> event, just use it. Just write your question. OK, go for it. So now I would like to go to Anita. Anita, we already alluded that you've been pretty much all over the world. So, um, but I have a question for you, because you come from a very interesting background. And I think you have like a bit of a perspective of AI in different countries. Can you give us some insight there, like what's happening? Something that really kind of really struck you? So I'm originally manufactured in Vancouver. Awesome, all right. <laughs> and I went to a medical school in Holland. Uh, after Holland, it all started going <laughs> crazy because then I ended up in eight different countries. Um, I started my AI journey, I think now nine years ago in a startup in Spain. Cool. All that right. was an NLP model for online doctors. So it was cool because I could connect the medical expertise, medical wording, and then also the uh, started learning AI. So I went to the, um, it's an online program, really amazing, from Stanford University. So then you learn to speak like the AI engineering language. And now at IBM, <laughs> IX, I always say like, a, I'm a really luxurious and expensive translator. Because the only thing I do all day long is translating between what is it the tech needs, what are doctors talking about. So I went from different hospitals in Dach. Um, we worked together with um, also in Jerusalem with a hospital, Hedassah, where we're building a stroke AI with four different cultures, four different uh, hospitals, and um, we're doing a predictive stroke AI. So besides the fact that medically it's very challenging, <laughs> it's also working with German doctors sometimes is very challenging um, because I do a lot of things paper-based and then we're talking about AI and then they tell me, uh, can I fax you this document? And I'm like, excuse me, what? <laughs> I went to school in Switzerland and Holland. I don't do the fax. So um, culturally, it's really um, interesting because you're not only getting the barrier that, okay, I can talk to, in Spanish to the doctors and ask some questions. It's just also the trust that doctors have in AI. I feel like um, I've worked the most in, in DACH and a lot of German doctors, they don't really believe in the system. There's a lot of like uh, mistrust. When I talked to Spanish doctors, they were, from my experience, like, oh my God, 
where do I sign up? Let's do it. So it was really, um, or when I work in Israel, Israeli doctors are a little bit more tech affine, um, but I've only worked in two hospitals who are very American based. So culturally, it's super interesting. I mean, AI is beyond just being tech. It's so much more being human, believing in it, trust, and bringing everything together. <laughs> Anita, you've mentioned two really important words. You mentioned mistrust and you mentioned culture. But you also mentioned doctors. Now we know that healthcare is not just about doctors. It's about healthcare professionals. But Regina can give us some insight into what's happening in medical education. Yeah, as Anita mentioned, I mean, it's the doctors feeding the data. Mm, yeah. yeah. I think this is crucial. How do doctors, medical doctors, and also allied healthcare staff perceive AI? What is mm -hmm. in for them? And what do they gain if they feed the data into the systems? I think this is crucial. And mm. this is why we have been involved in healthcare, health workforce development for quite a while. Okay. And I think it makes a difference if we talk ab uh, about academic training, right. pre-graduate, or you talk about post-graduate training and those on the floor who should feed the systems and have the, build the trust for them to feed the systems. So this is a big difference. Uh, um, I would like to start with the academic training. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot has changed due to the COVID pandemic at many universities and the universities of applied science. So we are used to do some online teaching, remote teaching in different mm -hmm. versions, synchronous, asynchronous. Mm -hmm. uh, and young students are, uh, are highly attracted by uh, artificial intelligence and, and using internet and using the data sources. So it's easy to get into contact with them. For instance, my students, I... I tell them to, to use anything, also chat GBT, but the problem is that they have to critically reflect the information they are getting. So on one hand, we need a profound education on the content, the medical and the paramedical content which we deliver. And then we have to equip them with the uh, capacity to critically reflect uh, on the information they retrieve and what does that mean for their certain patient they are dealing with. So the problem is to get them into person-centered care. But this is easy going. I think we are on the right way in the curricula at the moment. Uh, we, okay. we are rebuilding a lot in the curricula, at least in Austria. And I know it also from the European Union, which, which I have the pleasure to work with many colleagues across Europe. I think the crucial point is the people working yeah, nice. in the system at the yeah. moment, because they have been used to work as they work, mm -hmm. as Anita said, yeah. on a paper. Yeah. And they have not been uh, yeah. checked for the data quality so far. Mm. And I think there is a lot of uh, resistance among yeah. healthcare workers. This is what I feel at the moment. And I do a lot on continuous professional development. Uh, and I think we have to collect all our capacity and force uh, to go ahead and come up with a program supporting these people and breaking down the barriers in, in, in continuous professional development. I have development. a question to all of you. Maybe we start from Ricardo this time around. And how are we going to help our healthcare professionals? How are we going to use possibly, how are we going to do, do, use AI to get there? Is this like some dreaming fairyland or is, can we get there? Can we help our healthcare workers? And I'm going to ask you in the, in the, in the interest of time and also because we want, we're going to have some questions from the audience, please, one sentence. I know it's challenging, I know it's challenging, but how will, help, how will AI help us reshape this? you know, this conundrum that we have ahead of us. Go for it, Ricardo. In one sentence. Mm, um, you can do it. So we need to make sure the technology actually delivers something that is useful for patients and doctors. And myself, having worked as a physician at the beginning of the digital transformation, mm -hmm. I saw the frustration of doctors spending more time hitting a keyboard than actually getting anything out of it. And that is a major challenge right now. And I'll stop there because you Hold don't Hold the thought. Anita. My God, one sentence. You can do it. I believe in you. <laughs> Go for it. Um, one sentence. I would say um, get rid of the fear to adopt one specific tech. So either you go into Metaverse, either you go into Gen AI, and then become really good at it. And then you learn faster. That's, That's really good. Mm, I like this. There, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask, and I have two sentences. Okay, okay. I'll now give I have you had my one. Um, 
I think AI can actually contribute to this data quality. And I'm very happy about this uh, project that is a European project about an improvement of uh, data quality, the curation of data that we do together with uh, my oh. hospital and the Graz University and other nice. wonderful people in the European level. So that's the good use of AI for the yeah, curation You already bought these and you didn't tell me? Oh, no. <laughs> Regina, go for it. Um, AI has to sophisticatedly support patient care pathways, mm. stratifying, monitoring, um, and then discharge management and educating those who work in the system. And I think as long as we follow this path, it makes sense for the people. Wow. Well, pathways, culture transformation. But now, is the time for our audience. Maybe we should start with Slido first. What do you think, Hanuka? Yeah, let's start with Slido then. Yeah. Actually, there are a couple of interesting questions. And, oh, it's going to uh, be a hard one. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm suffering here about the reading. <laughs> tell me, tell me. But uh, I see a red line between a couple of questions. And this mm. is rather asking about data quality and how do we mm. ensure that we are having the right quality of data. Uh, for such things. So maybe let's start with this. What do you think? Yeah, I, th I like this one. Huh? Uh, guys, you're going to answer, huh? not me. So you tell me. Oh, yes. If, if, I, if I may start, I think uh, in principle, uh, the quality of data collected depends very much on the system that, uh, where this mm. is entered. Okay. So okay. if we can... Um, uh, I think just by telling uh, doctors and nurses that you have to introduce better quality data, it doesn't make them better. Uh, mm. And if we apply the digital on uh, chaotic data, then we just get digitally chaotic data. Mm. So uh, w what I want to say is that if we organize the system in a way that it will support the entering the data or it has some automatization in it or that collect it collects automatically and it is all somehow hard harmonized and interoperable, I think we have done a huge work. Okay. The problem nowadays is that um, we collect a huge amount of data with the different quality, with different scales, and then we store them in PDF files. So I think that we don't get very far with it. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm actually kind of even thinking of the words stewardship. Make them responsible, make them understand, like, listen, this is you're doing a job, a great job. Like, try to like have ownership. But like, they have this kind of responsibility. They have the stewardship. They are treating people. Ah, okay. So <laughs> here we have like, we, guys, want to give it a shot? At this question, yeah, go first. Just Ricardo. very quickly, uh, there's another angle I would like to bring to this conversation okay. because, especially in low and middle income countries with COVID, a lot of uh, practitioners were complaining about the, the violations of their data sovereignty. Hmm. And what we're seeing right now is really the wild west of artificial intelligence and healthcare. And imaging technology is almost all driven by AI. There's data collection processes going behind the scenes that really there is no one controlling. And the data is being collected to headquarters very far away from Europe, yeah. uh, where they're yeah. being collected. And so I think we really need to address this with a strong regulatory framework. Yeah. Uh, and actually, if I may, in 10 seconds, just to say that tomorrow there's going to be a networking session at 9.45, right here on Responsible AI for Health. And we're going to address exactly that. Super plug, man. Love it. Really, really streamlined. Now, I have a question from the audience. Who would like to ask a question? We need a roving mic. Okay, can we get one, please? A roving mic for. So, Annika, you have a question? Should I wait can... for the microphone or just go? <laughs> you, can, you can go if you want. Like, sorry, Annika. Thank you. Um, no, Annika Eberstein. I work for Philips, so some of those uh, AI applications and medical imaging are ours now on the market. And I actually have a question for Professor uh, Roller Wiensberger. When you mentioned patient. Uh, centricity. I'm always triggered because, you know, when you try to implement technology and old processes, that's that's often where the disaster happens. So, could you go into a bit more detail on on what AI actually means for workflows, for how healthcare is organized, and what you actually think needs to be changed? Happy to do to, to do so. Actually, this is part of our research work at our university. So, I come from old age care, and I work with very complex complex people. 
Um, and what we are doing is either using AI, uh, using as a motor unit to, to, to build awareness among the professional where in the care pathway is their duty and what they contribute. So use the solution to build the health workforce capacities. This is the, this is the one region, uh, the one thing we do. And the other thing we do, it in, for instance, in our hospital is uh, that we come from the patient journey perspective. I, I mentioned stratification. Okay. So for instance, we have a problem with delirium. Delirium is really a quality marker of care of older people in hospital. So we, we are not able to train everybody as mm. geriatrician, mm. but when people step in, and we have, we have used artificial intelligence and algorithms together with the te technology partners uh, to design a tool that is implemented in, within our health record, electronic health record in hospital, that in the background when a patient shows up is screening through the algorithm, is there a risk for delirium, yes, no. So if we have a risk, it shows up on the surface of the patient and our doctors are able to click on there. And the system tells them why a patient has a risk and what to do. This is what Teria also mentioned. It's, it's a way to train our staff. And then we induce a care pathway through hospital for this patient because we know he's a, a, risky, a risky patient. So we have two sides around how we implement it. But to, do, to be able to do so, you, you have to follow up in a co-creation process and you have to to include those who are working in the system, who can tell you as technology partners, this is the journey and these are the crucial red flags on the journey of a patient where we could use artificial intelligence to support our healthcare workers to do their work. Does that answer your question? There's a whole discussion after that, but yes. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I'm, I'm already seeing that this conversation will continue afterwards. So unfortunately, I'll have to take another step here. And now what we're going to do, something a bit more exciting now we have. We have some headlines. And the main question that we would like to ask is, is AI a friend or a foe? Something to think about here. And we're going to start. Can you spot the bot? Study finds chat GPT almost undetectable in medical advice. Whew. Thoughts? Maybe Anita? What do you think about this? Huh? Tell me. 100% your friend. Hmm. Um, but I'm again on the side of um, hearing my doctor colleagues talk about how evil AI is makes me really tired <laughs> because um, I, I don't want to have a diagnosis anymore without an AI. They, okay. It's better, it's more okay. accurate. Okay. Um, there's articles out there published every single day, uh, research that even IBM is doing that a chat box is even as friendly as a doctor is. <laughs> that there's barely any difference. If you, if you don't know, you actually couldn't spot the difference between a bot or a human. So I am 100% as your friend. Make it your friend, learn the tools, understand also how to tweak the tools for your own benefit. I like that you said, learn the tools. I think that needs to be an active part of our process. Ricardo, thoughts? I really think this is an important uh, issue of the symbiosis between machine and, and humans. That's where we have to go. And it, JAMA published an article last April where basically patients responded to a chatbot. Half of the responses were from real doctors, the other half were machines. Huh. And the machines won in terms of outcomes, which one can say is normal, but they also won when it when the question was about empathy and compassion, oh. which makes you think that maybe we are training our healthcare workers to be trying to make them machines instead of being humans. And if we try to make them machines, the machines will always win at that war. Mm. So maybe we need to redesign our educational pathways to be focused on the compassion that we as humans can bring in this symbiotic relationship with machines. I truly believe that this has to start at the base of education. Moving from disease systems to health systems. Teria. I just want to add that uh, probably then we are training machines to be humans. And we are hmm. better in that training. Wow, one second, because that's quite deep. <laughs> but now, maybe, should we go to the next one? Because this uh, one uh, is... Don't you want other people to answer the question, friend or foe? Oh? Yes. I like... would like to answer that question. Okay, go for it. Tell I me. think friend. 
Friend. I think friend. friend. We can make it as the enemy as well. Ah. But uh, I think I, I would like to quote here a professor from the Tallinn uh, University of Technology, okay, cool. uh, Professor Peter Reuss, who said that uh, uh, we are not uh, going to win if we replace the doctors with machines, but the doctors who are using machines will certainly win. Mm, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, Regina, I have the next one, and this one is a good one for you. Huh? <laughs> Next title. What's up, bot? AI chatbot ChatGPT could help students pass exams to become doctor. Experts warn. Friend or foe? I don't have a problem with that. OK. Elaborate, because please. Because we are working with technology partners to detect what comes from students and what comes from technology. Mm. So um, actually, all um, exams are screened by software okay. that is able to 98% to detect what comes from ChatGPT. Okay. Well, are, are exams still done in handwritten or are they actually typed out? Because there are still some countries who actually do handwritten exams. So. Actually, if, if any, just to give you a glimpse on, on medical education, more and more we are going back to oral exams. Already, yes. Yes, they I've have the time to Poland prepare. As well as well. Yeah, we have. They have the time to prepare for it. Okay. Because it's uh, beyond knowledge transfer. We can see how well students are able to cross-connect information, yeah, and process. I don't. I don't mind if it comes from technology. Yeah. They, and then they are able to apply it to a case. So I. I, I don't have a problem with that at all. Hmm. Anita, you're a doctor. You can tell us what friend or foe. It's a friend. Yay! I do all yeah. my okay. German emails with ChatGPT. <laughs> <laughs> no, especially doing language translation is okay. an right. amazing tool. Yeah, it is. Because I think in English, and yeah. then if I have to constantly communicate to all my clients in another language, and now also Hebrew, I'm like, okay. Oh, Hebrew. Wow. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Phew. Well, that's that's quite a thought. Now, hmm, shall I go to the next one, guys? What do you think? I go for it, or we we ask for some more on this. <gasps> UK commits 13 million to cutting edge AI healthcare research. Friend? Good. Oh, yes, great. Love it. Love the enthusiasm. Tell me more, because uh, I, I'm not happy with a good. Like, you can tell me more of it, huh? No, I think that um, if we rely on uh, ChatGPT, on uh, kind of like uh, that's the only artificial intelligence that oh. we are using, then I think we are going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to ensure where this information comes from based on which the AI is built up. And uh, that is not Dr. Google, who is the original source of all information available uh, worldwide. I think there is a lot of crap as well yeah. that could be. And are we sure that this uh, chat GPT is so intelligent to make the difference between the scientific source of this information and evidence base and all these things? I think if there will be the research behind it, and we will rely on the evidence-based uh, resource to build it up, I think that it's wonderful. I just think that it's not enough. Yeah, in fact, like the, the idea of open source AI, AI comments, you know, it starts, it starts coming up again, eh? because we sometimes, especially when it comes to ChatGPT, I have to say, we really don't know what are the data sources. There are billions of parameters mentioned, but we really need to get down to the bottom of it, like try to understand where are the answers coming from. I just have uh, hope okay. in uh, European health data space in that sense. Hmm, okay. okay. I right. really very much hope that it will happen. Okay. I know how difficult it has been to implement the cross-border healthcare directive with just agreeing even the small document like patient summary. But uh, I hope the European health data space has better takeoff. Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be um, in the national contact point of eHealth in Malta as a manager right now. And so I do understand this point very, 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 very clearly. Ricardo, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a, as if you wanted to say something. No. Can you tell me a bit more about this? I, I, was, I was agreeing. Uh, and um, so my role is as CEO at IDARE, the okay, International yeah. Digital Health and AI co uh, Collaborative. And 
we've been endorsed to be the implementing partner by WHO as on the regulatory front. And so nice. trying to nice. support countries precisely on addressing this because my greatest fear is that we will lead towards a world of fragmented regulation. Mm -hmm. All of the investments we see in AI need to reach a market. Okay. We're seeing billions mm. and billions being invested in technology. Mm. But the question is, then how do we actually define what is safe, what is presenting the quality that we demand, mm. and what is actually effective? And how do we monitor the impact over time? How do we create a pricing model? How do we create a reimbursement model? All of this needs to be defined. And actually, in healthcare, more than other sectors, we have the experience of health technology assessment in medicines mm -hmm. and in medical devices. We could use that same approach for, for artificial intelligence. And that, I think, will help us address partially the challenges that we're, that we're talking about here. Because in reality, I don't believe that the world will all, automatically, all, all of the tech companies say, we want to make it our technology open source. Mm. So how do we address this? How do we okay. fix this problem? I honestly believe if we create a safe regulatory environment where if those companies want to have access to a market and to reimbursement, mm -hmm. they have to open the AI box. They have to show the training sets. They have to show the data sets that they use. And they have to show how the learning process is ongoing. It's critical that we create a safe and regulatory environment that protects the IP for those companies. This is a discussion that we're far from still. Many countries are focusing on general regulation on AI. Healthcare is extremely specific, and it's a high-risk area because it's our data, and it's our, 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 which is considered highly sensitive. And I think there's a huge opportunity for the European Union, since we are leading the way in many of these regulations, to actually take a step forward and take healthcare as a, as a, a core area of investment. Anita, you're now? I'd love to hear their thoughts. It always makes me sad when I see such a big number. Because <laughs> there's so many startups that fail okay. because we don't guide each other or okay. we don't... What's sometimes for me missing is that we don't um, tell also the journeys of things that don't work with AI. Yeah. We, she, we need yeah. to start sharing way more. I'm very, very mm -hmm. happy that we do this with IBM. We okay. call them our little fuck-up sessions. So <laughs> where, we, <laughs> where we collaborate and we really talk about all the stuff that didn't work so we don't waste resources and people on this again. And then we find solutions on, okay, where do we tweak? What do we do? So every time I see this kind of number, and then also to know um, if, so I did a PhD research. Okay. Take seven 17 years when you research something uh, of a diagnosis to get to the patient bed. Yeah. And this is just crazy. Uh, like if the technology would accelerate this, and then you see all of this money lost in the system, and you're like, ah. <laughs> so wow. it always makes me a bit upset when I see numbers like this. Yeah, we need to really get value from that money. So now, Regina, before when you answer, then I have a surprise for you. Not, <laughs> go for it. I'm still wondering why people have a problem that doctors don't believe in AI when I listen to my colleagues on the stage. Can you tell me a bit? So there is such inhomogeneous information on artificial intelligence, mm. and we want doctors to feed the systems and to trust in their decisions where they have been trained to decide on themselves what to do. <sighs> so I, I strongly recommend to to put doctors in all the processes and also to go for a, a more joint communication strategy when it comes to AI with my colleagues. So, the surprise is here. Right behind you, there are some more questions. Okay, you can turn around, you have a swivel chair, or you can see them there as well. Okay, very interesting. Um, so what I would like to, what I'd like you to guys do is take one question each from the slider. Can we do that, Aniko? Is that okay with you? Yes, totally. Let's do it. So You see here the top voted questions, actually. Mm, so th these are the top on voted ones. Okay, great. Way, exactly, democratic way. Hmm. You see on the screen. Hmm. So, I'm going to, Ricardo, you are going to take, maybe, all right, I'm going to be a bit of a dictator role a bit here. <laughs> so, Ricardo, you are going to take, how can we use AI to transform our sickness systems? That's for you. Anita, I'm going to tell you to take, how can we assure that AI does not have biases towards patients? That's yours. And Terje, I'm going to ask you, since you are the Chief Medical Innovation Officer, to take the question from Mark Hennessy. Okay, can you do that? And Regina, I've seen you communicating very clearly and effectively, so I want you to take the one of inter in terms of communicating risks and be benefit. Okay, so starting from you, Regina, what do you think? Uh, 
in terms of communicating risks as benefit, how do we mitigate fears in parts of the healthcare workforce regarding their changing or their maybe shrinking role due to AI? Um, actually, I can't answer that question because there is okay. no shrinking role. I think uh, oh. we, have, we have a difference in how we... I think this is an issue of health workforce development. How do we get people fit and build the capacity that they're able to integrate AI as part of their communication with patients and designing uh, the, the person-centered uh, treatment plans with, with their patients and to build trust? I think we, we are quite used as doctors to build trust with our patients and a trustful relation. And um, if I'm convinced that what I see from the AI stratification tool is what we, what we should include, then I'm also able to communicate this with my patients. I'm, I'm sure we need to include this in our curricula. This is not present in many of the curricula at this, at this time point. Yeah. Ricardo? So there, there are a lot of ways to, to address this challenge of uh, transforming the six systems into sustainable health systems, using AI for more health, quality of life, and so forth. I, I think it starts at the governance and the financial models in healthcare. Okay. It's because at the end of the day, the incentives have to be aligned towards pushing the health system in that direction. And I fully agree with Regina, healthcare workers have to be part of that. We've seen that in my country, Portugal, where when we started measuring outcomes and started putting incentives at the primary healthcare level, we doubled the outcomes in, from one year to the next. So doctors, nurses, pharmacists, everybody's human and respond to incentives. The critical issue is, first of all, defining outcomes. It has to be the patient who defines the outcomes. And that has been a problem because we have always focused on outcomes from a procedure level. We have industrialized healthcare focusing on doing more surgeries, more visits, more treatments, more medication, but at the end of the day, people are sicker. And so we have to ask patients, what do they value? What is important for their quality of life and embed that? So we, patients have to be part of the decision process, not someone we hear, not someone we consult. They are sitting at the table making those decisions. And then the technology steps in because then you have com community-based outcome measurements where you start measuring the data using AI. You can actually extract data sets from the, the, the community using that. You can monitor the impact of the technology and the healthcare system in the, uh, within all of the, the community and making sure that then you create the financial incentives to go in that direction. And you use AI to support all of the system from the administrative staff to the doctors, supporting you always going in that direction. So at the end of the day, if you have a technology that doesn't simply show that you are lowering the burden of disease or ensuring a better quality of life or making the work more efficient for the healthcare workforce, you should actually ask yourself if that investment is worth it. Because if not, you probably are just contributing to using a technology to perpetuate many of the problems of a broken health system that focuses on disease. Transformation, right? Yeah. That's really amazing. Terio and then Anita. I think I just have to respond to uh, Ricardo first. Because okay. you know some people get help in the hospital. So uh, I don't agree that uh, they all get more sick having visited the hospital. I think some people will get better, uh, and majority of them, actually. So uh, let me disagree with this point with you. Uh, but the question has disappeared that uh, was mine. Ooh, was it uh, in uh, terms of communicating Mark, risk and benefit? Well, doesn't matter, actually. I remember what this question was. Yes. Uh, the question is, how to make sure that the patient will uh, stay outside the hospital or will stay less ah. days in the hospital? And I think that AI has a very important role there. Nice. The hospital is still unavoidable. I feel sorry for that. But people get sick, they get into accident, they get the emergency care, which is needed. But what we can do is by uh, using AI to really implementing the personalized approach by analyzing, not perhaps so much personalized, and it's certainly not necessarily precision approach, but we can stratify patients better. We can select the treatment options better. I think that, for example, the work that uh, in Estonia we have done with pharmacogenomics, even the selecting the medicines, the pharmaceuticals that will work cool. because of you have this type of metabolism that will work for these medicines. I think that's a great 
great help. So uh, looking at the hospital perspective and as the coming from the third level hospital, we usually uh, only deal with acute phase of the treatment. Mm. But what we can do with that is we can contribute to the patient pathway. We can have with this uh, smooth trans uh, transition <coughs> from hospital to general practitioner to help patients to monitor their health chronic conditions from home to avoid unnecessary hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. I think what I liked really very much, uh, the example I heard more than 10 years ago, was a Czech psychiatrist who introduced a very simple artificial intelligence model for his schizophrenia pro, uh, patients oh, wow. by asking 10 different questions and asking to evaluate on the 10-point scale the patients and one of the friends or relatives simultaneously at the same time every Thursday reported to the doctor the 10-digit code based on huh. which the signal came, if it was outside the range, mm -hmm. then the signal came to the doctor who on Friday morning then took connection to usually change something in the medication dose. Mm. And uh, this presentation that I heard at the Garmian uh, conference, which is the organization of uh, patients with mental diseases, okay. was accompanied, was done by the doctor and accompanied by the patient who was very happy about the results accompanied using it. by the patient. Yeah, by the well, patient so cool. who was using this tool and said that thanks to this little simple tool, he ha she has been able to avoid uh, hospitalization for a long time. So I think that what we could do with this AI is to keep patients then uh, under their own responsible control and... Uh, uh, medicine adherence, if necessary. I think that in geriatric, it's very often this kind of how to manage this uh, process uh, in the optimal way. And I don't think that we could get rid of the need for uh, healthcare professionals, but we could really optimize the re use of resource. I think that's a good uh, outcome. Can you just respond? Ten seconds, because I, I was I was challenged. I, uh, 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 I just want to okay, say, okay. I, I fully. I'm a physician. I, my first ten years of work was as infectious diseases. I, I fully understand the important work that is done. What I'm trying to say is that many of the patients that are treated, if we had had a preventive model in place that AI can facilitate, many of those patients wouldn't get sick. We wouldn't have to treat them. And with the aging of the population, if we do not lower the burden of disease, if we do not avoid those people getting sick, the money will not be enough to treat everyone. We need to free up resources to treat those that inevitably will get sick. That's what I'm saying. And when we see the rise of the burden of disease, non-communicable disease, diabetes, cardiovascular, cancer, neurodegenerative, it's across the board in all of Europe. And looking five years and 10 years and 20 years ahead, it's continuing to grow. The money will not be enough. And I think we should embrace technology to make sure that those people working in the hospital are treating those that will get sick anyway. But, uh, Ricardo, I fully agree with that, what you said. But before, you said something else. No. no. Ah. But if I, uh, now it's clear. Right? I, I love it because this is what makes our conversations alive in Gastein. In fact, if you see on your bag, to be discussed. What to like, discuss at Gastein. So I think, you know, this is the kind of flow that we really want here. Anita, uh, there was a question for you and you didn't have the time to answer it. You want to go? Sure. So the last question was, um, uh, how can we assure that AI does not have biases to our yeah, patients? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think we should see it in two different parts, this question, because uh, AI will never have a bias about you. It doesn't give a shit about you. <laughs> it's mm. the data that I put in <laughs> to how I train my uh, my okay. machine learning model, the input that I okay. give train. it. And train. unfortunately, yes, I do have biases. I probably, I'm tired, I have a night shift, I have an opinion about you. I don't know, uh, you're, you're a different person, you smell mm. different, eat different, you have a lifestyle of Berlin that I don't believe in. So I will <laughs> have a bias. <laughs> okay. And I will probably feed the system maybe wrong, even though I don't want to. So I think this question, for example, we have to split it a little bit um, okay. because if you train it um, really like in a box where mm -hmm. you're saying like this is a parameter and this is exactly how you're supposed to function then this is how it will function there will not be any it's like I always see less like, less like a little black box where you you put in the values if you start like letting your AI run around fl freely where everybody can throw in whatever it wants from Wikipedia okay then it gets a bit uh, <laughs> yeah. out of control with the answers but so this question I hope I answered it well enough but uh, 
Um, so the biases come from you as an individual putting it in, into the system. I like how you took the approach. Um, Teria, you have to forgive me here a bit because I would like to answer another one. Forgive me, forgive me. There is a question by Alvaro Serame from the European Junior Doctors. So I thought at first that this was a comment. So please forgive me if I didn't read it first time round. So very insightful ideas presented by the panelists. I would like to know how does it relate to head workforce? specifically in relation to recruitment and retention policies. And since, Terry, I took the mic away from you before, you can go ahead, I'll give it back to you. All right, I'll throw it back. And maybe you would be the first to answer this one. What do you think? Uh, well, I just uh, can't not refer to uh, American surgeon Atul Gawande, who nicely yes. wrote okay. in his book about uh, being biased that uh, AI has this privilege of not being, not putting too much emphasis on something uh, yeah. which is not so important, but takes okay. everything neutral. Uh, I think that the health workforce, I don't know about the recruitment because I don't think that we are going to use AI in the recruitment, okay. but um, I think that nowadays the young doctors who are graduated from the university are more knowledgeable and more um, uh, eager of using this type of technology it's somehow in the blood right. for them more. Mm. Because I, I'm very happy that we have if professors like Regina who teach this type of attitude. Because okay, what cool. I'm sometimes thinking is that is our level of teaching in the universities sufficiently sophisticated in these matters? so that the young generation will come with this attitude. Uh, I have seen only, uh, if I am working with our doctors, we have this kind of club of innovators. Yeah. They are very eager to use these tools, which would help them doing their work faster, yeah. better, avoid these kind of unnecessary trials, things to try, which don't work anyway, and somebody gives the advice that it don't work. Yeah, I mean, uh, in fact, just now, just in Italy, there was a group of Italian doctors who set up the first society in Italy for artificial intelligence in medicine. Just young doctors, you know? And I want you to build on that, Regina, because I'm sure you but have like, lots no of There is no young doctors. So what we see is we have a shift from generation Y to generation Z. Y is mm. finishing studies at the moment, and Z is entering universities. Oh, okay. And right. they're completely different. And I think this is the challenge for the academic institutions yeah. that we get along with these changes because they're challenging us. Yeah. Uh, the asset I see as a geriatrician is that there are many old people in the system, and uh, the treatment is very complex. And we do not succeed to train them sufficiently mm -hmm. when they start their career in, in, the clinical t in the clinical environment. They don't feel safe with complexity. And I think for the recruitment, this is the asset. If a hospital uh, for the trainees offers support systems that gives them a kind of backup and, and safety, this uh, increases their uh, safety when dealing with, with this stuff. Independently, they need to communicate with them. Uh, and I think this is work enough for a beginner. So I yeah. think there is a lot of things to do for us as educators and trainers, but there is no young stuff at the moment. I see completely different generations within six, seven years. Yeah, so even like this, this idea that uh, medical education possibly needs to reshape itself faster, like this continuous growth. And Anita, like, you know, you've been through medical education, you possibly like really understand even deeper this question. Can you give, give me some thoughts about this? We had this discussion. <laughs> Go for it. No, it's, um, so I studied 14 years and all right. uh, yeah. when I put all of the, and the MBA and uh, all of this uh, data Collection and, stuff is, yeah? and nice. blah, blah, blah. So 14 years, I, I'm pretty sure I can reduce this to six because okay. all the other all right. stuff I will never use, I've never used, and I don't even understand, I just passed my exam. Like, huh. <laughs> like, right. this is okay. a medical school is of course way more hands-on, so you learn yeah. depending on which medical school you go to, but okay. like for us, when we did dermatology, we applied it Im immediately. We did cardiology, you apply it. So then you, you're very, it's a very practical training. Hmm. I think if you want to be a modern doctor, it could be reduced to four years, like at EDU in Malta is okay. doing. 
together okay. with the hospitals and Helios yeah. clinics. Yeah. And so uh, because there, it's a lot of just like learning, learning, learning. You can do this remote mm -hmm. and then the practical stuff you do later. If you decide you don't want to be this kind of doctor, yeah. you can still do osteopathy. You can do so many other amazing practitioner jobs that if you are a bit like uncomfortable, I don't want to do tech or I don't feel comfortable in this new kind of world. I feel like there's there's so many also in Germany of the Heilpraktiker. It's a very hands-on training. If you if you just don't want anything to do with tech, I feel like there's there's options also. Talk sorry to, sorry to Re refuse. Regina. You can't learn a knowledge transfer for four years and then apply. This is really old-fashioned. So modern medical education integrated from the very very first day in a kind of spiro curriculum, and I think this is up to us to integrate it in a very very nice integrated way connecting knowledge with all these digital skills they need, not just learn and then apply. I think this won't work. This is not sustainable. Ricardo? Just very going a bit back to what Regina mentioned about the oral exams. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, because yeah. I think it's all interconnected in the sense that even pre-grad, when you talk about high school and even earlier, from a young age, you really need children to learn a critical process thinking in this new world. And the thought process is what actually passes on with the oral exams. Yeah. And, and I fully agree with what Regina was saying before. Technology should actually be embraced, you know? If a doctor is in an ER and is, not, is, not, is saying he's not using Google or ChatGPT, they're lying. It's okay, as long as they know how to interpret it. As long as they yeah. know how to use it. Yeah. And, they, thing, and they you know? know that there may be hallucinations with ChatGPT, that it can't be said, you know, what's said there is not written in stone. What I see on Google may be right, may be wrong. It's a support tool. Yeah. But you have to have a critical thinking, which yeah. I think even is wider than medicine. In society, when we use uh, Twitter or X or whatever it's called, and you, you you read what's on it, when you use social media, we need critical thinking because people sometimes take what they read just because it's on the internet as real. And no, we are humans and we have that capacity to process. If we have that symbiotic approach to, meta to machines and humans, I really think we can actually go towards a society that is stronger and more resilient and can work towards the survival of our, of our species. Wow. Anita, you want to answer back? <laughs> What do you think? This is like drop the mic, right? That's fine. Like, like, uh, just gonna, just, yeah, so we'll give you that. But I'd like to move on now. So I would like to take one more question from the audience here. Oh, go for it. Roving mic. Just introduce yourself and go, for, go ahead with the question. Van Tomek, we had a conference uh, of the think tech Integrated Art in March in Kassel. And um, medical tech doctors, uh, philosophers, IT experts, young guys, I'm, I think I was the oldest one. Uh, but I studied medicine and went into business and um, a lot of experience with data. And we, we decided um, about the ethical concept to handle with the new te technology. Because IT is just the part of a new technology. And uh, we had all in our decades new technologies. And we had always fears of these new technologies. So I think there's not a principal difference between uh, KI or IT or whatever, um, I have the same problems with this uh, iPhone because uh, it tries to manipulate me, like Google. Hmm. They all, the, the total technology tries to manipulate. That's the part of the business. They want to see these photos and that photos and to uh, give me a reminder of this and that, which I don't need. So I think it's an ethical, um, it, it's necessary to think in a new ethical way, in a kind of new governance uh, to handle with all this on a meta thinking, not just the details. Yeah. I would like you to so dive deep my, into your question. Go for my, it. So my question is, um, are there the right people to talk about 
uh, this uh, inter the interdisciplinary theme. All right. It, is, it okay. not, is it not necessary that there are philosophers sitting oh, and sociologists sitting and we discuss it in an interdisciplinary way, not just using it now for this special subject, which yeah. is important, of course. Yeah, I think this, uh, this is my, my principal question. Yeah, interest of time, go for it. I'm going to ask you, I'm sorry, but like, if you can, like one minute, not more than that or even 45 seconds, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for raising the issue of ethics, because uh, for at least if you look at AI and health workforce, it's a matter of intercultural competence. Mm -hmm. AI is a new culture coming up. And if we talk, uh, talk about intercultural competence, it's all about communication. And I think we, we in the Western world, we have we are built, our healthcare systems are built on the autonomy of our patients. And then we are coming up with a crucial question, is the autonomy of our patients still there? And what do we have to do to integrate new technologies in a sense of intercultural competence of our workforce? And I th I'm happy to go along with this in the, in the discussion after the panel. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Integration. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Okay. No, I just wanted to say that the treatment of each and every patient has to go be seen through these ethical uh, yes. questions. Okay. Great. Anita. No comment. Ricardo. And just a suggestion. The idea of responsible or trustworthy AI is precisely the ethical principles that should guide us moving forward. There is a new initiative called the Global Initiative on AI for Health which is a partnership between WHO, the ITU, and WIPO. If those that are interested in this multidisciplinary approach, their idea is really to bring together as many different visions, and I fully agree with you. We need to bring in those that typically are not part of this discussion, the sociologists, the ethicists, and so forth. They all have to be at that table. Here's a platform at a global level that certainly we can all contribute to. Okay, so I have a little surprise for everyone. Since this is a topic about AI, we would like to start generating some AI images. Hmm. So, the first word will be integration. Arjant at the back is doing something. What would the second word be? Anita, you decide. Tell me. Culture. Culture. Third word, artificial intelligence. Fourth word, Gastein. Another word. Anyone wants to give it a shot? Raymond, go for it. Equity, love it. That needs to be our common goal, equity, love that. Okay, so Arjan, I think we should give it a shot, shall we? Go for it. So we have to wait a bit, okay, let's see. I'm seeing, I'm checking on my phone if something is going on, hmm, the mid-journey bot. All right, aha, 0%, 0%, it's coming, it's coming, we have to wait a bit, all right. In the meantime, whilst that is being generated, because we have to wait for some graphic cards to do their job. Some final comments, guys. Like, I'm going to give you like 30, 30 seconds each to kind of wrap up a bit of a reflection on the session. Maybe ladies first this time, Ricardo. Regina. Artificial intelligence will be part of our healthcare systems, and it's up to us to shape the ethical grants that is built on. Okay. I think Daria. we have to make the uh, data quality right and uh, education uh, good. Otherwise, we will just build artificial intelligence on uh, something which is not so reliable. All right. To move AR, AI forward is what you said at the beginning. Okay. Connect everything. So connect your doctors with your tech people, with the education system, with your patient, in order to you know to make it happen. Because you have too many cultures, too many influences from all sides. If we don't teach our patients together, as we're teaching us at the same time to make a better treatment plan, AI will probably not have such a fast future. Ricardo. So I would uh, reinforce the idea that patients have to be at the heart of everything we do and citizens at large from a community-based healthcare approach. And that should be also at the heart of what we do when addressing responsibly AI. And legislation should be done in a way that is loose enough 
to keep it safe, but at the same time foster innovation and making sure that under loose reg legislation, you have strong regulation to make this a reality. Fantastic. So, so, guys, we have our image and it will be sent very soon, actually. Oh, okay, okay. So that was actually the original image. We had like one of those, all right? And then I said, I was able to choose one of those. So I went for the, f the, the one, the U4, that, was, that means that I chose the, the fourth one, and maybe could we try to get the next one, please, the final choice, possibly, is it possible? Let's give it a shot. And then what I did after that, maybe we'll show it very quickly, I was able to do zoom out. Something quite a really cool tool that I like. I was able to zoom out two times, and I was able to kind of get a bit more of a deeper view. Let's see, maybe we'll give it a shot. Can we try or not possible? Okay, two seconds, two seconds, sorry. Okay, no worries, guys. So with that in mind, I would like to close the session. We need to give one big clap to our, oh, 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 we found it, yes! <laughs> Thank you, Mari, for your persistence. A big clap to the audiovisual team who work overtime to... Yeah. I appreciate it. I love the intensity, guys. My goodness. <laughs> so, so that's the final picture. I think at the end of the day, I think we can collaborate more than anything. All right? And, if we do, and it's always better when we do things together. Enjoy. Thank you.